So hello everyone and welcome to my last nice blast in the 240. So this video is meant to be a little bit of an overview on my ownership experience over the last three plus years and give you my thoughts on pretty much every aspect of this car. Now I think first and foremost what most of you are interested in is the performance for the money. Now I think that is where this car in particular shines really strongly because for the money there's there's really not much better that you can get. Nowadays you can pick up this car in the low 20s and earlier B58s like the 340 under $20,000. Now, if you're picking up one of these cars for $18,000, dollars $23,000, this, this is really, really a crazy car. Because you can throw, you know, a thousand bucks in mods at it and you can be making ridiculous power. Like, that's just stupid. And again, you can get that for $20,000 all in, which is insane. Obviously, if you take into account something like the old V8 muscle cars that you can buy for $3 and throw an LS in there for five bucks and then you're going crazy. Yeah, obviously for the money, you can't beat that. But most people aren't gonna do that. You know, not everyone has YouTube stacks. Not everyone can do all the work themselves. So, you know. Now, everyone knows the B58 has insane performance for the money, but how is it in terms of reliability? Now, again, I feel like most people by now know that the B58 is a relatively reliable platform, and if you maintain it well enough, then it will treat you perfectly well. Now, in my three years of ownership, I've put on a little under 30,000 miles, and in that time, I have been stage two for about maybe two thirds of that, and this car has not really given me any issues. Now, even before I had tuned it, both of my Vanos actuators actually went bad and I replaced those. Now, the thing is, the Vanos is kind of a reoccurring BMW issue throughout all the different platforms. And this one in particular, it's one of those issues that it's more common than it seems. I put out a video on how to fix it and a lot of people said that they had the same issue. The dealerships told them it was normal. No mechanic knew what it was. And lo and behold, a lot of people still had this issue. It's not super uncommon. However, the actuator itself is about 60 bucks online, at least when I purchased them. And even if you don't really know what you're doing, it's pretty easy to fix. I mean, I am, I'm not a mechanic. I am super duper amateur. I can do some basic stuff. The first one, it took me about two hours to do with some basic tools, and the second one took me about half that because I had already done the other one, I knew what I was doing, and I knew the techniques, and it wasn't that bad. Now, I buy all of my parts off of FCP Euro because they allow for a full lifetime replacement warranty. So I was able to do that first one for 60 bucks, and then I was able to do the second one for free. So in unplanned maintenance costs, this thing has only cost me like 60 bucks, which is nothing. So once you've tuned the car like a lot of the B58 guys are gonna do, people wonder what the long-term reliability of these cars is like. Now, I can only speak from my own experience, which as you know, has been really good, but I've seen plenty of other people that have gone further than I have. They've gone stage two plus, they've gone upgraded turbos, they've gone ethanol, and I've seen very few really unexpected failures on these cars. Now, if you look into B58s at all, you'll probably hear horror stories of bad injectors that cause the engine to grenade and then you're just screwed. Now, as much as you'll see that, you have to remember that if you look on the internet, nine times out of 10, the only people that are gonna be posting are the ones with issues. So if you keep that in mind, it's kind of like Yelp. Nobody leaves a Yelp review if they're happy. So the number of B58s that are actually failing from injectors is pretty low. However, if you're kind of anal about your maintenance and you really want to be bulletproof, I would maybe do injectors at most, but after that, I mean, you're kind of good. Now, that being said, most of the injector failures I've seen have been on cars that have gone beyond stage two. So once you go stage two plus and you start having upgraded fuel pumps and ethanol and whatnot, that's when injectors seem to fail. I'm no expert, I'm no mechanic, but just take that with a grain of salt. So we know that B58s are getting pretty cheap to get into and pretty cheap to maintain, 
but what has been my running cost for this car? What's the gas? What's the insurance? Once again, it is pretty good. Now, in terms of gas mileage, it's no Prius, but again, for the performance, it's pretty ridiculous. If you're on the highway following the American speed limit, which depending on your area is anywhere from 60 to 75 typically on the high end, but most places around my area are 65. And if you stick to that speed limit, you can very easily get pretty damn close to 40 MPGs. And I have done that once because to be honest, it was rather a painful experience, this car. I, I hate driving 65, it just feels so slow. But if you drive more like myself and stick closer to 80 miles an hour, maybe a little over that, the gas mileage is still pretty good. Now with the 8-speed ZF like I have, your RPMs aren't even crossing over 2000 until you get to about 80 to 83 miles an hour. So even at that speed, I usually average around 27 to 30 MPGs, which again, is really good. Now, what is this car like to insure? So I've had two insurance companies with this car now and both of them actually rather strangely treat this car like an M2. Now it's obviously not an M2, but on my insurance policies, it'll say BMW M2. So what you're thinking is, oh, it's probably gonna be insane to insure, right? Not really. I actually have some of the cheapest insurance out of any of my friends who drive stuff like Mustangs, Velosters, WRXs, the insurance is actually pretty dang reasonable. Now, I live not too far outside of Boston, maybe 30 minutes to an hour, depending on traffic. So insurance costs will vary greatly by location, your age, your driving record, etc. But I have a clean driving record. I got this car when I was about 22, 23, I think. And my insurance costs at the time when I first got it were only about one, 30, 140 a month, which is not so bad. When I turned 25, my insurance decreased as is typical in the United States. And at that point I was paying closer to 115 a month, which again, for a car of this performance seems really, really cheap. Now keep in mind, I also have no accidents. I have no tickets on my record. The one accident I had was seven years ago, so it falls outside of the jurisdiction of the insurance. So that is no longer relevant to the cost. Honestly, it's hard to fault this car. It truly is. It is comfortable, it is fast, it is reliable, it is affordable to buy and maintain. I have very few bad things to say about this car, but that does not mean that this car is not without its faults. Now, this road that I'm on in particular is going to be a pretty good show of what I'm talking about. So, my one fault, which depending on who you are, is not really a fault. Honestly, for back roads like this, which is kind of what dominate my area, is for residential roads, it's just too fast. I mean, honestly, even a half throttle in this car on most of the back roads in my area is just absurdly fast and way faster than I would ever feel comfortable going since I value my life. Now that's like a third throttle and I'm already like just, I'm just cruising, so. Honestly, on a back road, it's it's hard to really get the most out of this car. It's just, it's so fast. <laughs> You'll hear a lot of people say it's a lot more fun to drive a slow car fast than it is to drive a fast car slow. Now, obviously on back roads like this, the car could be going so much faster, but you know, it gets to the point where it's just too dangerous. In all honesty, if I'm on really tight back roads like this, with MHD, I have map switching and I have a low boost map. And a lot of the times I just kind of stick it in the low boost map. Now being in this low boost map, it's only got high 200s for horsepower, which means I can stay in it so much longer before it actually becomes way too fast. So that negative kind of turns into a positive because again, if it's tuned to be way too fast, you can also tune it down a little bit for back roads. Which seems backwards, but in all honesty, it does make it more fun because you can kind of just wring its neck a little bit more. Like 
this is even 270-ish you know, horsepower, that is plenty. That is plenty in this car for these tight back roads. Now, leading into this also is the handling on these back roads. Now, this is not a light car. This car in X-Drive form is a little under 3,700 pounds, which is, for a car this size, really heavy. Now, you have to remember that this car is on the same chassis as the 3 Series, which is a four-door sedan, so it has all the weight. Ignore me doing weird wrist movements because my wrists are a little messed up. But for a car this size, it is pretty heavy, which means that the handling is a little floaty and not the best. And pair that with the really crappy all-season run-flat tires that come on a lot of these cars from the factory, this one included, they're super skinny. They're 225s all the way around, and it is a fat car, and the suspension is a little floaty, so that kind of makes for not the best experience. Now, that being said, it is all relative because I have a friend with the Mustang GT which shares a similar weight. It's also a little over 3,700 pounds, not too far off. And in comparison, that thing really feels like a boat. When you drive the Mustang GT performance pack and this car back to back, it really makes this car feel like a go-kart. So again, depending on what you're coming for, this car still can feel like it handles really well. If you've watched my recent video, you know that I recently purchased a 2000 BMW M Coupe, which weighs about 500 pounds less than this car does. So obviously, in comparison, this thing's going to feel like a boat. So I'll say it a third time, it really all depends on what you're coming from. If you're coming from anything remotely pedestrian or like a muscle car or something, this will feel like a really nimble, great handling chassis. Now, for a couple years, I did run summer performance tires on this thing in the summer months at least, and that really, really fixed it a lot. You really need the right tires to make this chassis feel alive. Because otherwise, with the really bad all-season tires that this comes with, it really just kind of is an understeer machine. And to be honest, even with the summer performance tires, I did a staggered setup, which is 225 in front, and I had 255s in back. It was still pretty understeery. However, it was a lot, a lot better than with these current tires. So if this car is so great, why am I selling it? So here's the thing, I am not raking in the YouTube cash quite yet, so I don't have the money and or space to own two different cars. So what I was looking for in the car to replace this, which ultimately became the M Coupe, I was looking for something a little more old school, a little more raw, a little more involving, and that is what I got. That car is a lot older, it's got hydraulic steering compared to electric, it's got the 5-speed manual instead of the ZF 8-speed, and overall, it is just a much better handling chassis considering it's lighter. So really, it kind of depends on what you want out of your car. So for three years, this car was my daily driver, which for that purpose, honestly, amazing car. But I'm kind of a weirdo and I wanted to be more involved with my driving and I wanted a slightly better handling chassis. And the 2000 M Coupe is kind of where I landed. Now, objectively, by every measure, that is a worse car. It is smaller, less comfortable, slower, you know. Obviously, most people would say that this is a better car. However, that just offers something more special feeling than this does, which again, is not taking anything away from this car. It's just, you know, it's very German. A lot of the new German cars like this are like, oh, you want to go fast? Okay, we go fast, and you just go fast. And next thing you know, you're going 120 and you don't even realize it. And you're like, oh crap, I'm going so much faster than I should be. And then you have to reel it back. Going fast in this car kind of feels like, I don't want to say mundane, but the sense of speed is very, very reduced in a car like this. Even with the exhaust work, the car seems very kind of muted inside, which obviously if you're listening to this, might not sound like the case, but here's the thing, that is mostly fake. If I turn the fake noise off, this car is super quiet and it sounds like a vacuum cleaner inside, even with what I've done to it. So ultimately, why I'm selling it, I just wanted something a little more exciting. Now for someone that only cares about straight line speed and drag racing and winning races, this is it. I mean, for the money, 
you're doing three and a half seconds zero to 60 if you get the x drive and go stage two you're beating 99.9 percent .9 of things on the road pretty much anything outside of the newest top of the line performance cars but for someone that wants something a little more engaging and lightweight and you know just more exciting on a back road then you'll probably want to steer somewhere different now just to wrap things up would i recommend this car and i would undoubtedly say yes i mean again it's hard to fault this car it is just a comfortable missile as a daily driver it's perfectly comfortable it's spacious enough it's super fast now how i would categorize this car i would say the m2 is definitely a sports car but i would say the m240i is more of a grand tourer now the point of a gt car is to just blast through miles super comfy super fast and i think that is exactly what this achieves now once again anything in that category kind of compromises a little bit of handling in order to give you that comfort so as a daily driver something like that is absolutely perfect so overall guys i have been very happy with this car and i would recommend it to anyone that might be even remotely interested if you want something a little more engaging i would go for the manual rear wheel drive however if you are wanting a daily driver or you live in areas that get snow like i do the zf8 speed and the x drive have been perfectly good to me so anyways guys thank you very much for watching and if you are interested in more content i will be posting primarily on my new bmw m coupe and eventually some more bmw stuff from some of my friends so goodbye for now, and until next time, here are the final remnants of the Beaver Boy Burble Team.